people can be in Bitcoin. We hear that you are thinking about Ethereum. These are incredible things. How, now, BlackRock is not known as a, uh, a gunslinger by any means. So you obviously must believe that this may be as an alternative. Is this an alternative uh, in order to be able because of the a deficit? Maybe something long term people should have? Absolutely. Um, as you know, I was a skeptic. <laughs> yes. I, you know, I was a proud skeptic. That's, that's, <laughs> and I studied it, learned about it, and I came away saying, okay, you know, my opinion five years ago was wrong. Here's my opinion today. This is what I believe in today. I believe the opportunity today. I believe Bitcoin is legitimate. I'm not trying to say there's not bet misuses like everything else, but it is a legitimate financial instrument that allows you to have maybe uncorrelated, non-correlated type of returns. I believe it is an instrument that you invest in when you're more frightened, though. It is an instrument when you believe that co countries are debasing their currency, de debasing their currency by excess deficits, and some countries are. I believe we have um, countries where you're frightened of your everyday existence and have an opportunity to invest in, in a, a something that is outside your country's uh, you know, control, then you can have more financial control. And so I'm a, a major believer that there is a role for Bitcoin in, in portfolios. I believe you're going to see that as, an, as one of the asset classes that we all look at. I look at it as digital gold, as I said before, and I do believe there's a, a, there's a, there's a real need for everyone to look at it as, as one alternative to, I would say, the optimism that I have in the world. If you want to hedge hope, Bitcoin is not a, an instrument for hope unless you're hopeful you're going to make a lot of money on it. <laughs> but it, I, I look at it as a vehicle in which you're expressing your, your financial acumen in something that you're more frightened of the world. You're more frightened of your existence. And I believe there's a great industrial use for it. And I, and I think a lot of people are missing that. I couldn't agree more. I changed my mind about it, but you did. You had been my thinking. It was like, uh-uh, you don't believe it. So I can't believe it. I want to thank Larry Fink for the message of optimism. Welcome to the Crypto Teacher. And you know I come back with that video just to make you think. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. And make sure you join the Patreons. If you're not a part of the Patreons, make sure you're in the Cash App. And guys, make sure you go to TikTok if you have TikTok. I know I was one of the ones that just got it because my son told me to. But if you do have TikTok, make sure you go follow like and this channel right here guys make sure you like subscribe and spread it everywhere because we're close to the fourth industrial revolution and how do we know we got larry fink of blackrock on national television says that he changed his opinion after five years and guys we know this is nothing but the hegelian dialectic he knew all about bitcoin the same way jp morgan morgan stanley Know about Bitcoin. Buying behind the curtain, but telling you, you better not buy it. It's a scam. It's only used for criminals. But guys, we know the banks are the biggest what? I'll let you finish that. And he likes Bitcoin due to the deficit. And yes, guys, are going to tokenize this whole economy and put it on blockchain. And once they get these supercomputers cranked up, it won't be a human involved. And then we had Jerome Powell in the house. And he says the economy is performing well. And then also the labor market is strong. And we know that is definitely not correct. And he mentions Milton Friedman. And we know Milton Friedman stated the only entity that can cause inflation is the money printers and government. We know the government allowed the Fed to print all this money. They printed 80% of all money in existence in two years. So they knew what type of inflation that we were going to get. And they caused the problem, wait for the reaction, and run in with the solution. And because of all this inflation, the economy is crumbling. And because the economy is crumbling, we know small banks, medium-sized banks, and businesses, small businesses, are going to hurt, which is going to cause mass unemployment. And we already see that starting. And we're seeing bankruptcy after bankruptcy. And they're getting no news. And with this fragmented economy, of course, their solution is to bring in the machines. Whether robots, algorithms, and drones take the economy over, 
pay each other with crypto and the sheep go inside the metaverse. And that hard landing, soft landing phrase is for the fourth industrial revolution. And we have AI comes up, chat GPT. And again, that's all for the digital economy. And that's the reason why the Fed has waited too late to cut rates. We already know it's a trillion dollars it's to service the debt. And the reason why they waited so late so then therefore this economy, the legacy economy can crumble so then therefore they can bring in this digital economy, these machines. And remember the crypto teacher told you, because he knows when it comes to the NWO, it's all planned out. You have a wonderful day. Um, David, I think I'll leave the markets out of it for a second, if I can, and just say that um, uh, it was really a very sad day for our country. Political violence has no place in our society, and I condemn it in the strongest terms. I know we all do. Um, a man died uh, at, a, at a political rally. Two other people were critically injured. It's uh, just a sad day. And I'll say that I'm grateful that the injuries to the former president were not more serious. I'd rather not comment on the markets. It's too... Uh, <laughs> no foreplay, huh? <laughs> Thing that the U.S. economy has performed really remarkably well over the last couple of years. 2023, last year, was a year in which the economy grew well above 3%. Uh, the uh, labor market remained very strong. Unemployment remained very low. And inflation came down at, a, at quite a sharp pace, per, uh, particularly in the second half of the year. By a very large amount, and and uh, um, that forecast uh, was almost unheard of. It was unheard of before 2023. So big upside surprise that year. This year, we had expected the economy to slow a bit gradually, the labor market to continue to gradually cool off after being uh, overheated a couple of years ago, and inflation to continue to make progress. And something like that is is basically what has happened. Uh, the the economy is growing now at about one and a half percent in the first half of the year. Most forecasters have about a 2% growth rate for the full year. The labor market, again, has moved into better and better balance to the point where I think you can now say it's essentially no tighter than it was in 2019 before the pandemic. Remember that the labor market of 2019 was a very strong labor market. So we're back to that place, no longer overheated. On inflation, we in the first quarter, we didn't, we didn't make any more progress. The second quarter, uh, actually, we did make some more progress. We've had now three better readings. Uh, and if you average them, it's, it, that's a pretty good pace. So turning to policy, uh, your question, what we've said is that we uh, didn't think it would be appropriate to begin to loosen policy until we were more, uh, we had greater confidence that inflation was moving sustainably down to 2%. We've been waiting on that, and uh, I would say we didn't gain any, any additional confidence in the first quarter, but the three readings in the second quarter, including the one from last week, do add somewhat to confidence. We've also said uh, that, you know, we're a dual-mandate bank, um, for a long time since inflation arrived, it's been appropriate to focus mainly on inflation. But now that inflation has come down and the labor market has indeed cooled off, uh, we're going to be looking at both mandates. They're, they're much in, better, in much better balance. And that means that if we were to see an unexpected weakening in the labor market, then that might also be a, a reason for reaction by us. Financial conditions, and that in turn affects economic outcomes, you know, growth, uh, labor markets, and ultimately inflation but with lags that can be long and variable, as Milton Friedman uh, famously said. And the implication of that is that if you wait until inflation gets all the way down to 2%, you've probably waited too long because the, you know, the, the tightening that you're doing or the level of tightness that you have is still having effects which will probably drive inflation below 2%. So we've, we've been very clear that you wouldn't wait for inflation to get all the way down to 2%. Our test has been for the past <clears throat> quite some time that we wanted to, be, to have greater confidence that inflation was moving sustainably down toward our 2% target. And what, what increases that confidence in that is more good inflation data. And lately here, we have been getting some of that. They don't produce inflation for one simple reason. They do not own a printing press on which you can turn out green pieces of paper. The only such printing press is in Washington. I say printing press, of course, in the modern age, we do it in a more sophisticated way. We use bookkeepers and accountants and computers. But it comes down to the same thing. Inflation is made in Washington because only Washington can create money. And any other attribution of, to other groups of inflation is wrong. 
Consumers don't produce it. Producers don't produce it. The trade unions don't produce it. Foreign sheiks don't produce it. Oil imports don't produce it. What produces it is too much government spending and too much government creation of money and nothing else. It's one of those things where, um, you know, where things turned out much better for a whole variety of reasons. I, I will say that on the hard landing question, I have always felt like that we, there was a pathway to getting inflation back down to our 2% uh, goal on a, on a sustainable basis without the kind of pain in the labor market, the kind of high unemployment that has been typical of tightening cycles and getting inflation down. And the reason why my colleagues and I thought that was that the labor market was so overheated that it could cool down quite a bit without having to, it, it, there still is apparently no slaver, no, no slack in the labor market. The labor market does not have slack. Essentially, you're at equilibrium now. But look where inflation is. Inflation's at two and a half percent. So this was this was in defiance of a lot of conventional wisdom. But we thought that was right. And that says that uh, you know the, uh, you have to be one thing you, you learn is humility in forecasting. But so I wouldn't rule it out. But I would say that the kind of hard landing scenario is not the like not certainly not the most likely or a likely scenario. So you can't reduce uh, unemployment to a, to a single number because for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, the the natural rate of unemployment probably moves through the cycle and over time. It's it's it, maximum employment is a function of, of many many different variables. It doesn't reduce itself to a specific number that would be durable over time. So inflation, as two percent inflation, some years ago became the global standard that everyone aims for in one way or another. In some parts of the, of the uh, society these days, people are making decisions based on something called artificial intelligence, AI. Uh, have you thought, have thought about, you know, calling up ChatGPT and saying, you know, you know, here's the, all the data we have. What do you think about it would be a good idea? Have you ever thought about that, or are they not going to like you to do that? We haven't done that. I mean, we have, we have done little things, like we've asked ChatGPT to generate questions for the press conference. Oh. And I'm happy to report for any journalists who are here that the questions were not as good as the ones we get from real journalists. So. What about my questions? How do they compare to my questions? <laughs> okay. No All right. So they weren't that great. <laughs> okay. So what most worried about? What keeps you up at night, if anything, in the economy? So I'll say in the short term, that's what keeps me up at night. Literally, you know, the thing I'm thinking about in the middle of the night is always this balance we have between not wanting to, if we ease too early, you know, we can undermine the progress on inflation. And if we wait too late, we can undermine economic activity. We can undermine the expansion. And, you know, so we want to get this right. And getting it right is incredibly important for the people we serve. So that is really, that's that's what I spend a lot of my, you know, thinking time on. Long, you know, longer term, there are lots of things to, to worry about. But that's really what you're going to a different economy. And we're going to be learning more about that uh, as we go. But clearly... We're, we're, we're learning that things can be done uh, from remote, remote locations. We're learning that technology can replace people even more than we thought. We're not going back to the same economy. We're, going, we're recovering, but to a different economy. And it'll be one that is more leveraged to technology. And I worry that that is going to make it even more difficult than it was for, for many workers. In Silicon Valley and my friends who work in technology know that what we did to the manufacturing workers, we are now going to do to the retail workers, the call center workers, the fast food workers, the truck drivers, and then even bookkeepers, accountants, uh, insurance agents, lawyers, and on and on through the economy. So what happened to the manufacturing workers is a very clear sign. And so we'll import Chinese-based CBDC technology. So it's going to be CBDC in a box. Uh, provided to you by the People's Bank of China. But every stock, every bond, every currency, every commodity, every piece of art, every private business, every piece of real estate will eventually be a token on a blockchain, an entry on a ledger, permanent and immutable. We will have truth instead of trust, and we will save over $7 trillion a year. Six to eight percent of global GDP is wasted by the friction of the trust industry that's necessary when you have dual entry accounting. With triple entry accounting, which is what a blockchain is, mm -hmm. we get rid of all of that friction. It's a beautiful future. Like what you see in China and their social credit scoring systems, right? If we get identity wrong 
you know, it could be a tool to enslave humanity. And if we get it right, it could be a tool to liberate humanity as an American, you know, uh, uh, I'm obviously rooting for the, the one that's on the side of freedom. Bitcoin is an international asset. And also, I do believe the role of crypto is, um, it is, it, it, it's digitizing gold. I actually believe this technology is going to be very important. I am, I, you know, look at it. We have been part of a huge revolution in investing through ETFs. We believe that ETFs will be changing the whole way we invest. Many people still use it as a means, oh, well, people are investing it f for indexing. No, the majority of people who are putting money in an index, in an ETFs are active investors that are buying exposure. The entire bond market is being transformed as we talk right now. I believe the next generation for markets, the next generation for securities will be, will be tokenization of securities. Um, we will, and if we could have that distributed ledger that we know every beneficial owner, every beneficial uh, seller, we all have our, our, our code right. of who's buying, who's selling, instantaneous settlement. And think about it, it changes the whole ecosystem. Chinese bank ICBC has been hit by a ransomware attack, and the U.S. Treasury market, as a result of that, um, has been disrupted. This, according to the Financial Times, we're going to get more right now with Bloomberg's Shanali Bassick. Shanali, what do we know? Uh, listen, we have the Financial Times now reporting that ICBC, one of China's largest banks here, was hit with a ransomware attack. And remember, they're a, a, a very significant intermediary in the Treasury market. The SIFMA has told his members that this has been part of the reason here uh, that the system is kind of clogged up, if you will, during that auction that we saw a little bit before. The attack had prevented ICBC, according to the Financial Times, from settling treasury trades on behalf of other market participants. A large executive at a major bank also telling the paper that such a large party on the fixed income clearing corp uh, creates major concerns, potentially impacting the liquidity of treasury markets. Now it was not just the poor auction. It was absolutely lousy, and, and uh, uh, you know, when, when the dealers have to step in to save a treasury auction, uh, that's a rare occurrence. And Crypto teacher and the new world order book, plus the three kids' books, it's time to re-educate. Also, new to cryptos, Coinbase, Bitchu, Binance. Do not forget book links and crypto links are in the description. The stock channel, guys. Don't forget to go like, subscribe, spread everywhere. You have your Kobo, your chip size, your banking, your gaming, while everybody's sitting at home, get on stocks, the receiver, the biotech stocks, and while everybody's at home wishing, they were still getting that free money. What are they doing? Drinking and smoking weed. Don't forget about those stocks, and you have a wonderful day. The most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. The storyteller sets the vision, values, and agenda of an entire generation to come. Steve Jobs. And guys, you know I truly believe in this. When you look at the New World Order, they're the storytellers. And that's the reason why I wrote my New World Order book. But guys, now it's time to change the current generation. And I wrote three kids' books. You know, I love the Trinity because I understand the power that's in it. So I have three books. We have an opportunity to change the generation, to educate, not just me, but I want to show you that I take action on a daily basis. And I want you to take action on a daily basis, whether it's your job, whether it's in your community. We have an opportunity right now to educate the masses. I posted this on my Twitter account. Please share. But this is a short clip of the three books. There's going to be a clothing line and action figure. Please get these books for your kids, nephews, cousins, friends. So therefore, we can start the re-education now. Because as we see, the fourth industrial revolution foundation is definitely here. Robots, algorithms, drones, taking humanity out the picture. We have to re-educate. But let's get into the video. Part 1. King Yashua and Gromatim. Save the village. Part 2. King Yashua and Gromatim. Save New York. Long COVID-33. Part 3. King Yashua and Gromatim. Goes to China. It's mandatory to get Part 1, Part 2, and Part 3 of this series. 
It's time to re-educate Generation Z.